Welcome to Memo Q Talks, where we talk to industry leaders about their experiences, lessons learned, and what works best across all areas of localization. Now, here's your host. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Memo Q Talks. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I will be your host for this episode of Memo Q Talks. Today, we're going to be talking to Max Troyer, who is the, the Associate Professor and Program Chair at Millbury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. That's a pretty big mouthful there. But, um, and we're going to be talking to Max about you know, some of the programs that they offer down there, some of the trends in education related to the local industry, uh, and more. But before we do that, I want to say hi to Max. Max, how are you today? Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for inviting me onto the show. I really look forward to talking about the language services industry and everything we're doing here at MISS. Awesome. Um, before we start that, I, I just know by the name of your university and from having talked to you before that you're down in Monterey, I'm assuming that's where you're at right now as well. Yes, we are about two hours south of San Francisco, um, close enough to Silicon Valley that uh, many of our graduates make their way north, a short trip up uh, for their, their careers in the industry. But yeah, Monterey, if you haven't been to Monterey, I recommend visiting. I think you've been here before. Though. I have, and it's like my second favorite place on the entire West Coast. I'm kind of partial to San Diego, but um, I mean, you get really, really nice weather there and you have beautiful you know, scenery and the ocean and everything. So it's an amazing place. Um, so before we get into the, the, the real subject, can you maybe set the stage and tell us a little bit about um, Middlebury Institute of International Studies? Well, I don't know how much I want to get into the the storied history of the institute, but it was kind of it was originally the Monterey Institute of Foreign Studies. It basically was to train diplomats, mm -hmm. um, and the translation and interpretation programs were launched maybe twenty five, thirty years ago. Some of the languages, the the TLM program, the Translation and Localization Management program that that I am in, was started about. 15 years ago, and I've been teaching for going on 11 years of that. So I've kind of seen the transition from translation interpretation to more uh, localization training to kind of adapt to what the market wants. Do you still offer programs, though, for, for dip diplomats or for people who want to pick up a language before they go overseas? We do. We have uh, a we have programs in non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, financial uh, crimes, uh, trade, environmental policy. We still have all of those programs. I don't know that we're necessarily training diplomats anymore. In fact, uh, one of my best friends, when I attended the Monterey Institute, he, he this is totally off topic. He was a, a chemical engineer working at Intel, designing microchips, studied at the Institute to become a German interpreter, uh, took the foreign studies exam and ended up becoming a diplomat. And that is not something that uh, and he, he saw coming uh, when he when he trained to be an interpreter. But it just goes to show how uh, folks in the language service industries, they have a lot of knowledge outside of, you know, just translation and interpretation. They uh, absorb a lot. Absolutely. And it sounds like a really interesting individual. i curious because I, the other thing that Monterey is famous for is also DLI. And I'm assuming that DLI, the Defense Language Institute, um, is still active in Monterey? It is. Yeah, we're known as the language capital of the world. That is actually trademarked. A former mayor of Monterey went ahead with that trademarking process. Um, and we do have the Defense Language Institute, which focuses on strategic languages for the United States defense industry so that we can uh, respond to what's going on in the world and provide language language support for intelligence gathering and and just not all intelligence, but, you know, boots on the ground, helping soldiers communicate with um, with local residents in country. So just at a community level, it seems like Monterey would be a pretty amazing place if you're into international studies or languages, um, et cetera. On the localization front, uh, what are you seeing these days? Is it same, you know, people want to become translators, they want to become interpreters, or are people more interested in project management? I mean, what, what are you seeing? Everyone who attends the Institute and goes into one of the translation interpretation or localization programs is passionate about languages. There's no doubt about that. Uh, to some degree, the decision is made based on one's non-native language level. If you are a native speaker in your non-native language, then you could potentially become a translator and or interpreter. Uh, but if you have conversational level with your non-native language, then 
you can't really become a translator or interpreter. Um, I'm not to say that it's it's that easy. Sometimes we have people who are fully qualified to be translators, and interpreters want to go into project management. And I think ultimately our graduates and people in the industry decide where they want to go based on what type of job they want. Uh, for example, as you know, translators, interpreters often have to run a full freelance business right? Um, go and doing sales. <laughs> when you right. tell a translator, by the way, you have to do sales or you won't have clients. Sometimes they balk at that uh, and, and want to run to the safety of a corporate job in you know project management where you have nine to five or maybe not nine to five, but <laughs> that's the idea. Sure. So, so, but when people, um, they do, they want to en enroll at, at Monterey, or excuse me, at, at Middlebury. Is it what about the language industry are they are they typically kind of working towards? Is it like I said? I mean, if they if they're the native level in their non native tongue, um, they have the ability to go towards a, a, transla a translation role or an interpretation role, but they could do that kind of on their own, right? I mean, what are they looking to pick up when they go through um, one of your programs? Well, I think that. What all of our students have in common is a passion uh, and desire to, you know, lower, lower borders, connect people, build bridges between cultures. And, and that's a passion that drives uh, many. We have uh, a lot of students who have done the JET program in Japan right. or the, I think it's Tapik, Tapif, I forget the name of the program in France. Uh, but a number of these programs around the world where, where Americans are brought in country to teach English. Uh, in country, um, those people come back with a, a burning desire to help uh, to help make the world a, a smaller place. Mm -hmm. And how that it how that is done is obviously through translation, interpretation, and localization. Awesome. And are most of your students then are they Americans, or do you have a majority from overseas? About half of our students mm -hmm. are are international. The bulk of those students are are Chinese. The uh, the Chinese translation, interpretation, and localization market is just uh, exploding, and uh, more and more schools are offering translation, interpretation, and st starting you know starting in the last five years, localization as an option with translation, um, cat tools, translation management systems, uh, project management, those kinds of things. So um, that's a, those, that's those, interesting. Um, when I was in a role with CLS Communication, I was responsible for Asian. One of the challenges that we had was um, finding good universities in China that had established translation studies programs, because historically, um, translation the study of translation wasn't considered um, a uh, I, I got to be careful how I say this, but it wasn't a kind of a, a regular career path that companies or people, individuals were pursuing. It started to increase in popularity, but the challenges we had, because we, we wanted to partner with universities um, and, and provide training and then recruit their, their best you know, students um, was, was, was finding programs. But the, in the last few years that I was in that role, we started to see more and more, not just the tier one universities, but tier two, tier three that we're offering. Um, but you're seeing now even just with Chinese students, a greater interest than not, they can actually go overseas and study as well and, um, and get into this industry. Yeah. And I, I still think that I don't want to offend anyone, but <laughs> China is still a little bit behind us in localization training. Yeah. And so a lot uh, of Chinese nationals come to the Middlebury Institute, um, study here for one or two years. And, and then because we're a STEM based degree, um, they can get up to three years here in the U S. So, Companies are really, uh, really keen on hiring these folks with Chinese native language. Uh, so they spend three years. Some of them get sponsored and stay forever. So when you uh, when and, you say three years, you're saying that after they graduate, then they have a visa that's that, that's good for three years after they wow. Before before we were STEM certified, that's the science technology. technology something <laughs> neither neither one of us are stem majors i guess <laughs> yeah i have a computer science degree oh okay STEM, well that's that, that was, that's that's stem yeah okay that was pre-stem um they all international students who study here uh, residentially get one year of opt optional practical training mm -hmm. uh and with stem the government grants another 24 months of of opt that they can apply for if they're in the industry so if they get a localization degree, 
they get uh, a one-year job in localization, they can get a 24-month extension. So super enticing to them. Excellent. Hey, I want to talk about the job market and how you prepare your students to go out and um, you know take part in the market. Before we do that, though, there, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about how technology is going to take away all the translation jobs, um, you know, specifically talking about AI and machine learning and machine translation. Um, and there are obviously the, the numbers of words, the volume that MT is handling is increasing crazily, right? But what do you, you know, so, so what are your thoughts? Is technology in the context of your programs and, and, and localization, is technology friend or foe? Well, I think from a localization training point of view, technology is, is mainly a friend. And for years, uh, technology has helped take away all the annoying parts of what it meant to be a project manager. Um, gone are the days of having to email translation kits to uh, translators. I don't even, I don't think anyone, any of our instructors sh show how to create a translation kit anymore. I guess in my games localization class, I still talk about translation kits and localization kits and how they're different from a games point of view. Um, but yeah, technology has, has really um, allowed us to take a step back and focus on quality and process, um, just getting our hands dirty when we need to, not constantly being in the garden, <laughs> trying to make sure that everything is, is growing. But uh, be, I like the kind of, this is not something I've used before, but the gardener analogy where you're, you know, walking around, making sure the plants are growing, make sure your translators are happy that kind of thing. Absolutely. And um, no concerns that uh, the, the, the market's going to dry up because one day you're just going to flip a switch and everything's going to be automatically translated. I'm not the first one to say this, but if the singularity arrives and AI is, is fully intelligent and sentient and can translate fluently in, into and out of all languages, then we have way, way bigger things to worry about than the, the collapse of the translation industry. You know, that will be the cl collapse of society. Um, right now, I feel like... Um, translation is mainly assisted by AI and technology. Uh, and, and I don't, I don't see, I don't see translators being made extinct. <laughs> no, but you know, it's interesting. Cause like, I mean, you, you think about how books used to be made, right? You have these, uh, monks in, in, um, that would be handwriting out, uh, you know, different editions of the Bible or whatever books they, they wanted to copy. And then you had this thing called the print and press, right? <laughs> and so did that, um, it, it probably displaced or it, it, some of those monks who or were earning their living uh, writing books. But what it, it did was it, it, it fueled an explosion in content, right? Um, and then you take away printing presses and you start doing on DTP, that didn't reduce the amount of content and or the, the, the total number of jobs. Again, if your job is running printing press, you probably going to have to, you start using DDP. You could still do the, you could still do the job. Right. And I mean, I, I know that there are pockets of translators, uh, usually in, um, I'm not going to say which countries, but, um, oftentimes working in for government agencies, for example, in-house, and they've been doing it the same way for years and years and years, and they still are reluctant to use cat tools. And they don't look at that cat tool as their friend when, Oh my God, like you, you, you mentioned the quality issues and taking away some of the mundane tasks, et cetera, the, you know, just the, the, the ability to use a terminology base or, um, you know, kind of some of the obviously spell checker, but you know, date synchronization, currencies, all that kind of stuff, which is like, really, do you want to spend your time, you know, doing all this stuff that you can automate and you can actually focus more on your craft, which is translating into into a, um, some kind of beautiful or the appropriate level of prose. So now I'll get off my soapbox. But I, I think technology is, um, at this point, it's still a, pretty much a friend. Well, Except when it doesn't when, work. <laughs> <laughs> there's that. Um, when when I talk to translators about what cat tools can do, uh, I try to use, you know, the 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 all the benefits. And you listed many of them. But just telling a translator, wouldn't it be nice to have a device that told you if you translated everything? Or right. if you... If you had a, a segment that was like twice as long as the source, or you have one word and the source segment has 20 words, just kind of the sanity check. Um, I used to do this, this QA exercise where um, I had a 12 page document that was translated into six languages. And in all the languages, I, I, all the languages I had introduced some, some bugs. 
And then I would let my students look at this, this documents and try to QA the documents. And they would find some punctuation problems. They would find some number problems, but no one ever found the untranslated sentence in, wow. even in, in Chinese, like it was very rare for a student to say, there's still some English in this, uh, in this document. So, uh, I think that any translator who says I won't use cat tools at, it's, it's, it's reckless. It's, it's a liability. And, you know, you, you touched on terminology. Um, if, if I, well, I am a translator, I've never been an active translator, but I would, I would love to have a tool say, by the way, there's, there's a word, you don't have to look this word up. We've already looked it up for you and chosen the word. That's, that's right. And, that's a, that's a gift. And especially if you're working in, um, very niche industries, uh, I, I, we do a lot of work with, you know, companies that are doing life sciences localization and, you know, there can be, term terminology that is appropriate for certain documents but then if you're using you know um if, if you're translating documents that are going to be read by consumers for example marketing um information it has to be it has to attain uh, readability standards and you have to use a different set of terminology and do you really want to i mean have it all up here yeah maybe you can do that or maybe you could just have it on your um, on your laptop so so let me ask you um in terms of the types of technology, what do you, um, as a as a university um, or as an institute of international studies, what what are you saying that are the must have tools that tr uh, translators or project managers they need to get their mind around before they get out of uh, before they graduate? Well, anyone who wants to go into project management has to know the best practices of, of process that mm -hmm. ensure, uh, you know, a, a relatively decent level of, of quality. And so just knowing about workflow and process and how, you know, historically we translate, edit and proofread, and that leads to, you know, good, good quality or good enough quality. Uh, but then adding on uh, all the other layers, the, um, the terminology, the, um, the, the more complicated file formats when we get into, you know, InDesign, mm -hmm. um, then we get into software, uh, Xcode, how we get uh, strings out of those, um, subtitling you... and dubbing and the post post translation integration back into these formats to create the, the final product. I mean, that's, that's kind of the, yes, project management, learning how to use XTRF or MemoQ or PluNet or one of these platforms to manage translations is is good. But um, we also want our project managers to be able to evaluate quality and know if someone does some desktop publishing, it, are there any are there any issues? Is there crashing? Is there, you know, font missing fonts, things like that? Um, can subtitling, can they QA subtitles and make sure that they're compliant with standards? Um, so there's a lot of things that I want our project managers to know. Do your project managers come in and say, hey, I, I definitely want to go into this industry. So for example, you mentioned gaming, um, you know, or, you know, obviously there's in, in the Bay Area, you'd have a lot of tech companies, software development. I mean, do they know where they want to go uh, as they're going through the program? I think that most students who, when they come to the Institute, into the TLM program, they want to go straight into the the tech industry okay. uh, and, and work on the buyer side of the industry. Um, historically, we, I guess, as a program and many in the industry want folks to spend some time on the LSP side, you know, working as a project manager in the trenches, learning everything that a project manager goes through and then taking those skills uh, in, onto the buyer side or into the buyer side. There are some though in the industry that feel strongly that, um, if someone has worked at an LSP and then goes to work on the client side, the buyer side, they have to detoxify them, de untrain them, uh, and train them up in what the what they need at the program level uh, at a at a technology company. So most of our students want to go straight to the, the technology. They want to work at Facebook or Google, one of those companies. All the culture that that has. Uh, but it turns out most about sixty percent of our graduates still go the language uh, services route their language service provider route. And when you say uh, detoxify after the LSP experience, what are you talking about actually? I, I think that the, uh, the project manager is really focused on the concept of the project. And we can talk about how the project is becoming a loosely defined uh, thing as time goes on, um, but traditionally focused on products, uh, projects. Um, and not a lot of big picture understanding of what the client is doing 
when you shift over to what clients are doing, they've got uh, they've got a lot more to think about, a lot more forecasting of future needs for translation, um, looking at new products coming online and how those will be supported, and then um, getting into all of the different divisions within the traditional company from products to retail to support to legal uh, and all these different areas. Um, and, and the project manager is really, you know, focused head to the head to the desk working on these projects whereas uh on the on the buyer side it's just a bigger 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 more things to worry about yeah i guess you'd have much more visibility in terms of all the different processes that you need to get in motion to get product released and the you know you mentioned all the different departments you have to align with you have to release dates and if you're on the lsp side you don't really have any visibility in that you get a, you know a, a, a translation project comes your way and there's a deadline attached to it but you don't really see all the things that are going on behind that um and that need to be kind of communicated etc so that, that, i guess that makes a lot of sense um i gotta say having worked um on the lsp side primarily the project manager in an LSP is a pretty darn tough role <laughs> because you, you've you got to communicate with customers. You've got to communicate with your sales team. You've got to communicate with translators. Um, and anything that goes wrong, you're right there in the middle. So it's an it's incredibly important role. Um, it, great role if you want to like improve your your communication skills uh, because it's it's really, that's what it's all about is communicating. Um, are, okay, so you mentioned Silicon Valley. What other areas um, do you see as increasing demand for? They're looking for um, you know new graduates that, that have this localization training. We're we're seeing a lot of success in the gaming industry um, with our our tech courses that we have. We have enough um, programming classes, and um, my we have a software internationalization and localization class, and then my games localization class. We get people pretty well versed in the formats that they will need to know uh, in the in the gaming industry. And we've had enough graduates go off now into the gaming industry that I'm, I'm starting to see some leverage with graduates hiring graduates, which is exactly exactly That's what awesome. we want to see. Uh, and, you know, when the program started 15 years ago, we, we were pretty much focused on creating project managers. But now we are training folks who can go uh, almost straight to Netflix and work on their globalization team and help with, you know, subtitling and and dubbing. Um, we've got people who come in with a computer science degree and can come out the other end as an internationalization engineer and go straight to a tech company and help their their software teams um, create global ready software. So it's 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 moved beyond the traditional project manager into much more exciting roles. One one role I wanted to mention. You 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 said you know project management is is really. Like really tough uh, and a cool challenging, a, challenging. challenging. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, one really cool uh, new, relatively new career is the uh, the account manager that kind of mm -hmm. sits uh, is positioned differently in different companies, but generally uh, kind of in between production and sales, mm -hmm. and often works with that sales team and does start to get some of those bigger picture things uh, that the the client is going through. So that's that's kind of a. Uh, um, if you're looking for a promotion and you're, you're done with project management, you know, you can go into quality, you can go into vendor, or you can go into the kind of the account manager before you move over to the buyer side. So what advice would you give students who are in the program right now or in one of your programs right now in terms of one, getting the most out of their studies uh, and two, for finding their dream job? Well, I think networking with their classmates is is step one, and I think that's a universal uh, advice for anyone in any kind of training. If you're if you're already in the industry and you're doing some training, you know, continuing education training, like network with those people. Uh, that's a great opportunity to make those connections. You never know who's going to be in a hiring de decision before or a hiring position before you get there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think networking is is a a big. Uh, uh, one of the biggest things they can do, and not just with classmates. Um, there's also when you, I talk about how students have a special hat. They're given a hat when they enter the program called a student hat. And when you're wearing a student hat, you can go up to almost anyone and uh, tell them you're a student, and and they will open up and and talk to you about, uh, you know, whatever whatever is bothering them or whatever you want to talk about. So that's a, a unique opportunity. And if anything, going to grad school or going to school is 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 buying access to, to people because you can just email people and say, 
can I schedule a Zoom meeting with you? I want to, how did you get your job? I want to learn more about what you do, those kind of conversations. Uh, I, I did not do this as a student when I, when I was, but you know, that's, that's something that I can tell our students, you know, take this opportunity, connect with people, learn as much as you can. Then I'm assuming you have a pretty established um, alumni network, especially in the, uh, in the Silicon Valley there. We do. Um, and I think two years ago, we created a, a TLM uh, mentorship program. It's now the, the TILM, Translation, Interpretation and Localization Management uh, Mentorship Program, where we connect second year students with first year students, recent graduates with second year students, and more experienced graduates with less experienced graduates. Uh, and once we get onto the, the graduate level, we're, that's open to anyone in the industry. It doesn't necessarily have to be someone who graduated from the, the program. And there are, we're not the only mentorship program in the world. Women in Localization has one. Um, I believe uh, the ATA may have one, Gala may have one. Um, so there, there are a lot, of, a lot of mentorship opportunities for students. And I think that is an awesome thing that uh, that folks should take advantage of. Excellent. And, and you mentioned that like a majority of your international students come from China. I'm wondering if you have, uh, whether you've organized or somebody else has done something, um, some type of alumni organization in China. We have a lot of Chinese graduates at this point, And I believe that there is a um, multiple groups Mm -hmm. uh, where they, they stay in touch. And once you join one of these groups, uh, you, you stay, you join as a student and stay in as a graduate. And so, um, news and rumors <laughs> <laughs> are quickly travel through these channels. So there's a, there's a pretty, a pretty tight, uh, Chinese uh, alumni network. That's, a, that's excellent. definitely, well, Hey, um, let me ask you here. So, um, what other trends are you seeing for loc education or the loc industry at all that that kind of is interesting to you? The automation it, for for several years now, I've been talking about the importance of automation. Everyone has been talking about automation, not, not just me, but I'm talking about it from the the training point of view. How how do we show people how to enable continuous localization uh, in these various uh, frameworks such as MemoQ? Um, mm -hmm. And I've been kind of, in all of my classes, I teach multilingual desktop publishing, uh, audiovisual localization, website localization, and games localization. In all of those classes, every single format that we look at, um, we look at in terms of how we can automate, how we can scale. Scale is another one of those words, automation and scale. Let's talk about buzzwords. But um, I, I can do one Photoshop file, I can do 10 Photoshop files, but can I do a thousand Photoshop files into 60 languages? No, I don't think any human uh, wants to take that on. So how, how do we break the system? And then how do we, how do we fix the system? How do we, how do we work around that? Um, one of our graduates just posted on LinkedIn, how do you, how do you automate Photoshop localization? And I don't think there's a way to do the post translation integration automatically, you know, take the, take the translated PSD files and automatically look at them and you know, fix the fix the font, fix the typography, choose a new font, resize the font if it doesn't, or resize the text if it doesn't fit. Um, so that's that's not really a thing yet. A human still has to intervene and do that. So how can we cut the human out and uh, and and do some auto uh, resizing and auto fitting of of uh, translated text? And 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 give me an example of something where you've seen recently automation come in and just go like, whoa, that's that's cool. Just all that work is taken care of now. Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> so um, WordPress localization or Drupal localization has has historically been pretty painful. And the, and the plugins uh, available for WordPress and, and Drupal were, were pretty basic. Um, but now most of the TMS systems have WordPress connectors, right. Drupal connectors that let you um, basically pull the content out of the website into the translation management system. Uh, then the work automated workflow is enabled. Translators are notified. They accept the job. Uh, and you know, the, the, the TMSs have different ways of notifying translators. Some will email translators one at a time and ask them if they want this job. Some will email a thousand translators and the first one to 
click, okay. I want yep. this job, gets it. Um, but then, you know, the project manager isn't really involved in that process. The project, the website uh, content is is published. The TMS notices, pulls the content out. Translators are notified. Um, they translate, edit, push it back into the system. Uh, and then de depending on the system, um, you can configure WordPress to then notify, I think it's called better notifications is a system I've used in WordPress where once the, once the translated content arrives, you can have automated emails go out to, you know, your, your quality folks to, to do Just the final, yeah. final QA on the, on the website. Yeah, no, that, that, um, that's a, that's a, a, a great example of automation and, uh, it's something that we see all the time. We're currently going through our, our digital transformation, uh, and, th and that means, how can we take our, our little cute program that used to have 20 students incoming every year uh, that now became 40 and is now up to 80? How do we how do we scale the program to 100 to 120 to 200 to 1000 uh, and still 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 provide that one on one experience um, that and maybe it's not possible, but we are we are looking to how we can um, adapt our courses uh, we're switching to a lot of a lot more asynchronous types of training where mm -hmm. students can um, consume content on their own schedule. Even for residential students that are in Monterey, we have uh, found that retention is better when students can. Um, for example, if I'm demonstrating a complicated technical process in a in a in a class. Um, you can't pause me. You can't rewind me five seconds. You can't read my transcripts, especially if you're Chinese. Um, but with asynchronous content, you can pause my video. You can rewind me. You can turn on closed captions. You can just, if I'm, if you already know what I'm talking about, you can just press pause and read the transcript. Like this, this is a, this is a very welcome change, I think, uh, from, from the, the student point of view. And we kind of got into this because of the pandemic right. sort of drove us, drove that digital transformation quickly. Um, and one student, I'll never forget one student, I said, well, we're going to be back in person. And one student said, Max, um, please don't get rid of your videos. I, I want those. I'm relying on those videos now. And this was a native English speaker. And I said, I have put so much work into those videos. I am not going to, I'm not going to throw them away. The ship has sailed. We are now using asynchronous training in, in most of our courses. That's awesome. I mean, if you think of platforms like Khan Academy, I mean, you know, it, it's such an effective tool. And he created that because I think he was working with a couple of his cousins and they needed help with their math or something like that. Um, and so he made these videos and it was like, wow, this is really helpful. And I, I've watched so many of his videos on different topics and it, it is super helpful because for all the reasons that you just said, one, I can schedule it to fit my schedule. Um, I can stop it, pause it, rewind it, you know, look at the transcript if necessary. I'm also a big believer in something called the flipped classroom. Uh, where, especially with language learning, where I don't want to go into the class and spend an hour having them teach me a couple vocabulary items or grammatical patterns. I want to study that on my own. I can do that on my own. I want to be in front of the class and, and, and practice what I learned. It's, it's, you know, it's that skill or ask questions. You know what? I went through the lesson and I have these questions. Can you please help me understand this? And I think that's the real value, in my opinion of live instruction is where you can have that interaction either with the teacher or with the other students. You can actually do it through technology and Zoom as well. Um, but those live sessions, I should say, um, are really helpful. But a lot of the learning can be self-directed and it's more effective that way for, for exactly what you said. So that's that's pretty exciting. And it helps you achieve um, a couple different things. One, it's it's effective, but also allows you to scale. Yeah. And, you know, flip flip classrooms, that's, that's the way we used to, <laughs> that is basically asynchronous learning, um, the, the, the ancestor of, of asynchronous learning. Uh, and that's exactly, that's what we're doing in the classroom. Now you come to class, you've, you've looked at the content, maybe you've attempted some of the exercises, maybe you got stuck and you come to class with your problem and you share that with others. Um, you know, the first thing we do when I, when I gather with students is we talk about last week's assignments and I pull up the best examples. Uh, I pull up, the worst examples and say, let's fix this as a class. And, and then exactly, we get into discussion. We talk about the this week's content. We talk about challenges that they'll have in the exercises. We look at the actual problems if they've already started it. Uh, and then we spend a little bit talking about what we're going to do next week. So it's it's a it's a better rhythm, I think, than uh, trying to, to, to do, it's a different type of teaching. It's still teaching, um, but it's it's not the the professor on the podium anymore. I never I no longer want to do that. 
Awesome. Well, hey, sounds uh, sounds like a lot of fun. And again, I'm I'm envious of the location, and I wish I could take a couple years off and go get another degree, <laughs> um, especially in such a nice place. But um, hey, uh, any any announcements or anything that we should be looking forward in the second half of 2022? So. One of the things we're really excited about um, moving forward is what we're calling learning path uh, courses. And this learning path is for people who have already graduated from either the TLM program or one of our translation and interpretation programs, or have already have gotten into the industry through other means. You know, we're not the only training option in the world. So if someone is already in the industry, if they want to level up their skills, um, they can come back um, or they can come to our program uh, and as a non-degree student, take uh, a set of courses in our learning paths. Like we have one that is based on software internationalization and basically includes some programming classes and in software internationalization games, localization maybe, and, and get someone up to speed in what they would need to take a computer science degree uh, and add on that um, international engineering skills. We've got the same thing and you know, we've got a create media and creative learning path. We've got the traditional project management, the program management on the buyer side. We've got a lot of, a lot of different options for those who um, are already in the industry, are not too happy with their career advancement, want to level up. This is their way to come back. They don't have to do a, a complete master's, a two-year master's. That's way overkill. Mm -hmm. They just need some skills. Mm -hmm. And this is our way of, of helping them do that. So we've seen some success um, with our, our new learning path. And, and will that be asynchronous or that will be um, on site or how is that? Some of the learning paths have completely uh, asynchronous options. There are some that have some, some synchronous classes, mm -hmm. um, but we work with the students on creating either either having them choose an existing learning path uh, or creating a custom learning path. And if they want only asynchronous classes, uh, we can do that. Now, all classes have a remote option, even fully synchronous classes. Uh, that are officially residential, we can let students uh, zoom into them. So that's that's not a problem. You don't have to come to Monterey, even though it is a nice place. No, that sounds like a a, a great program and a great option. I mean, continuing education options, and you, like you said, you can do it remote or in, in on site. Uh, so, hey, Max, I you know appreciate your time. I've enjoyed talking with you as usual, and uh, would like to wish you and the rest of your colleagues down there and your students an amazing second half of 2020. Here we go. Thanks for thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate uh, talking with you. Take care. Thank you for joining Memo Q Talks, where we talked with industry leaders about their experiences and lessons learned to gain new insights about what works best across all areas of localization. Join us next time on Memo Q Talks.